we have to acknowledge that many of the sayings that we have taken for granted as being from Jesus were actually uh, things that had been around for a long time before uh, among the Gnostics in their writings um, in the Apocrypha which predated uh, that uh, the supposed time of Jesus by a couple of hundred years and some of which could be uh, ascribed to uh, Yeshua ben Pendera, who lived 150 years prior to the supposed time of this Yeshua. Yes? Now, are you saying that because you want to point out that Jesus looked at or studied other traditions? Or are you saying that it's, it's a possibility well, that he never said these things? That's I'm a, I'm a, in my summation uh, in a in a couple of pages. I will give you what my analysis is of what happened or what possibly happened and how we got to the point we are today. And uh, I'll stay. Yes. Also, what's in those bullets that you have up there? Were the Essenes fit in there somewhere? Yes, we 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 covered that extensively last was yeah. the last time or the first time. But the Essenes, we um, many of the saints came from them, but they were a Gnostic sect. But they were Jewish sects who were otherwise known as the uh, the northern sect of the Essenes was known as the Nazarenes, of which uh, supposedly uh, Jesus was a member. And so was uh, John the Baptist and Mary Magdalene. Supposedly. What was their connection with Gnosticism? That they had, uh, they, they believed some of the similar believing that they believed in a mystical or mythical right. uh, Christ. That uh, one of the things that was unique about them is that uh, they uh, believed that there was a teaching that came from Moses, but that had been thoroughly corrupted and the, the, the Judaism that existed during this time was a complete departure from the original. Right. Even, even then, yeah. they yeah. were arguing yeah. about the corruption. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, um, we, if we have time, I can go back and review and bring up that uh, the screen on them. But, um, you know, in the interest of how much I have to cover today, <laughs> I think I'm, <laughs> I have to, uh, Lord Jones. Press on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> The Gospels, uh, titles that were attached to the Gospels by, were, were possibly attached to the Gospels by Papias in the mid-2nd century. Papias said that of the four Gospels, only Matthew knew Jesus, yet Matthew copies extensively from Mark, which is the oldest Gospel, gospel and Mark never met uh, Jesus. The Apostolic Fathers, Clement, Polycarp, Ignatius, among others, don't even mention the Gospels. So the, um, and when I was coming through seminary, we took it for granted what they were telling us that the time frame in which the uh, the gospels were written around were between sixty of the common era and uh, possibly eighty to ninety of the common era that they were written between that period. But for this, as we see here in the next section, uh, that. That probably was not true. Um, for instance, the Acts of the Apostles was written by Luke, who was a Greek physician. And the the key point about the the Book of Acts, which is supposed to be the the history book in the New Testament, um, the key point about it was that it created the notions of an apostolic apostolic council and apostolic age. It was the golden link that guaranteed a direct line of tradition from Jesus to the churches. In other, in other words, the history that was written in the book of Acts gave the authority to those who assumed leadership of the Christian church. And it was done with the presumption that it was written by Luke who was a witness to all these things and it was um, and it verified, you know, everything it was saying. The fact that he did, it was a witness. 
But according to Burton Mack in Who Wrote the New Testament, he says, we now know that Luke wrote most of his gospel, or whoever wrote Luke, his gospel and the Acts of the Apostles was in the early 2nd century, which is like around 110, 120 uh, of the Common Era. So that's long after the death, the life and death of Jesus. And when he wrote in, um, in Acts, he was writing as if he were a witness, because he constantly used the word we, we saw this, we, we, we. But uh, this, he, the writing was obviously almost a century or, you know, 70 to 75 years later than it actually happened. Um, when you say Acts of the Apostles, is this the text, or are you talking about Acts in the Bible? The Acts in the Bible. Acts in the Bible. Oh, okay. I yeah. didn't know it was called yeah. Acts of yeah. the Apostles. Yeah. I guess I just called, called it Acts. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, <coughs> um, he further says, no early Jesus group thought of Jesus as the Christ or of itself as a Christian church. All that was a much later development. Okay, <clears throat> one of the key points in Acts was Paul's conversion. And Paul, uh, if you recall, was um, part of the uh, Sanhedrin and uh, or the religious council of the uh, Sadducees sect. There was the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and then the Essenes were the ones that lived outside the uh, uh, the main council. And according to the timeline, the time frame that is in Acts, Paul was couldn't have been converted no earlier than 30 of the common era, given that Jesus was probably born at 4 BCE. And if that is so, he experiences conversion no earlier than 30 or around uh, 30 of the common era it states in Acts that and in uh, I believe Galatians that <clears throat> after his epiphany he did not go uh, up to Jerusalem for three years so that's uh, three and then um, after that three years it was followed by a second visit 14 years later And that was for the purpose of bringing relief for the famine that was taking place in Jerusalem. Now, <coughs> the uh, historical record states that the famine in Jerusalem took place in the year 44. So, <coughs> if you take 3 plus 14, that's 17 years, right? And... If you count backwards 17 years, that would put his conversion at year 27 when Jesus was supposedly still alive. So that it calls, uh, throws a monkey wrench into our whole conception of what happened and how, like I said, if this if Acts wasn't written until early, uh, early in the second century, Some mistakes were made in trying to construct that uh, yeah, the whole scenario. <laughs> yeah. Did Jesus write anything? Ah. <laughs> no, nothing that we uh, know about. So how do we verify what he yeah. said as if coming from his mouth? My mouth. We have no, no means of verifying. And... In all, um, as I stated, I think our first time around in the class, the New Testament is unique in that. Now keep in mind that prior to this, we have writings that survived from Kemet and Mesopotamia and other, elsewhere. We have the actual original autographs or doc documents that we can appeal to to find out what they actually said, what they actually meant. But in the New Testament, none of the Gospels or the uh, 
Pauline letters, Acts, any of the other uh, revelations, none of the original documents survive. And we don't even have the original. We don't even have the original copies that were copied. We have copies of copies of copies of copies. You know that. You know. Um, you uh, put a Xerox. <laughs> take a Xerox copy of something, and then you take a copy of the copy and a copy of the copy. Eventually, all you'll have is just a real grainy mess that you can't <laughs> determine what's what's happening with. And that's basically uh, what we have. Yes. <coughs> Brother Hesheska was asking about did Jesus say anything? Was there really a person? That, that's it's up. It's qu I'll just say this: it's a question mark. I, I won't definitely say no, he never existed, and I won't definitely say he was. Um, we ha outside of the Bible, we have uh, nothing that would verify his existence. We have writings about people who acted, who wrote and acted as if he did exist. You know, a lot of people give credence to that, but that's the best we can do. What if the apostles were, were attorneys? All of them were Storytellers. In other words, there's no archaeological evidence right. of his existence. Right. What about archaeological evidence for other things? Like we're talking about, you know, we didn't see Jesus write Jesus do we have writings of people who existed during that time? During that time. The um, earliest, I believe, was Polycarp. And Polycarp did, did not meet Jesus, but he was an associate of John, who was supposed to have been um, um, who's, uh, one of Jesus' followers and walked with Jesus. So I think so that might be the best. From Polycarp. Everything else came after. Yeah. Jesus was supposed to have had a brother. James. 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 Yes. Did James write anything? James wrote something. We have nothing of his, like I said, nothing originally from him. We had, um, you know, they found that uh, ossuary box that he was supposedly had his name on it. But they found that it was a forgery because it was, it didn't have the uh, the patina that was on it wasn't age worn or you know forgery. Yeah. So. I guess I'm just trying to look at this holistically, <laughs> right? Yeah. And if and if and I think it is quite suspicious that we can't find any writings of Jesus because mm -hmm. Jesus was such right. a major figure as right. he's built up to be. I don't right. know yeah. if. It was like that. It, you know, I've always suspected that people sort of built on the story over time and all of a sudden Jesus became this, you know, superstar, you know, yeah. type of see. But, um, but if we can't find writings from anybody else, then mm. is it consistent with, is the lack of information from him consistent with the time? I'm, like I said, I'm just trying to look at this holistically. They, there was plenty of writing going on at the time that survived. Oh, now, okay, so you say it, there but, is his, uh, another interesting thing is that of the documents we do have, the earliest of them, everything was written in Greek. And these were <coughs> poor, uneducated Hebrews. Hellenized. Hellenized. But if, if considering their closed culture and how, how closed it was, if they were going to write something, at least they would have wrote some things in Hebrew. But there's not, you know, everything was written in Greek. And the only thing that they say has a Hebrew flavor in some of the writings is some of Matthew. Not all of it. And I think some of uh, the book of Hebrews. But everything else is obviously written from a, you know, yeah. Much of what you've said is consistent with one idea. And that he was what we refer to as an avatar. Mm -hmm. you know, there was a figure <clears throat> we can't prove existed, mm -hmm. but as is said to have left mm -hmm. teachings that are beyond the ordinary mm -hmm. and uh, have led to the elevation of uh, followers or believers. Right. Avatar. Mm -hmm. 
mystical figure. Do we know who the teacher of righteousness is? Uh, no, that's who they, they refer to Yeshua bin Pindera as yeah, the teacher of righteousness. The Essenes referred to him as that. Any writings attributed to him? Uh, there are some, I think, there, I don't know if he would, uh, I have to go back and look and see if he, he was the actual author, but there's plenty of um, condemnatory writings about him from the, yes. by, by the, the rabbis who condemned right. him. Right. And that yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, I know a little bit about his life. Yeah, he that he he traveled to um, to Kemet there. and studied there and right. was uh, performed various miraculous things. Yeah. But he yeah. opposed uh, certain uh, specific leaders in the uh, the Jewish leadership back in Jerusalem who condemned him. He was eventually crucified, crucified. on a stake, yeah. not on a cross, <laughs> but a yeah. stake, and that. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, many of his teachings survive amongst the, 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 the scenes mm -hmm. treated his his uh, teachings with uh, reverence. So. so there were no even, sorry. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. <laughs> but there were many <laughs> parallels between Jesus his life. Jesus getting on our nerves text. You know? <laughs> He's what? Like there was no, like Jesus getting on our nerves. We, we, we got to do something about this dude. You know, text. There was, it was a, about Jesus, Yeshua Ben Pindera, but none, none about, about Jesus. Yeah. Yes. Was that the period of time as I heard this mythology? I'm not sure that he went there as a, as a child between the ages of 13 to 30. Um, I just no writings or no during persecution. Yeah, he was he was escaping persecution because they were. I'm, I'm not saying, sure of his age age at the time. But uh, well, it was supposed to be from yeah. 12 to 33. Yeah. And I understand that's why when you join the Christian Baptist Church, you have to be 12 years old before you are accepted for baptism. Hmm. Okay. That's in the church I went to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you're right. Brother Shango. Um, to me, there seem to be some similarities between the origins of mm -hmm. Christianity in relationship to the origins of Islam because mm -hmm. allegedly Muhammad never mm -hmm. wrote anything mm -hmm. either because he was illiterate right. you know? but yet and still we have the Quran yeah. and people work from that yeah. and that individual didn't write just like yeah. Jesus didn't write the Bible right but and he, he, uh, with Muhammad he was under the uh, mentorship of his wife who was right. much older than him right. and supposedly had a strong relationship with the Catholic leadership. Right. So, yeah. uh, He's an historical figure. Though. That's yeah. Well, we, we know he existed. Yeah. Yeah. We know he conducted war. Yeah. Right. We we know about his beliefs and so yeah. on that he expounds. But Jesus is different mm -hmm. because there's no really historical record, only biblical mm -hmm. references to his life. Mm -hmm. So if you believe the Bible, you're okay. Oh, but who was writing but, at that time? I understand, we, we can't, but none, I like, think what you said is yeah. that the people who existed at the time didn't really refer to Jesus. Right, right. Uh, well, they correct. did, if they did refer to him, they didn't refer to him in the terms that we understand him to be Today. as a Christ, as a Messiah, yes. as a miracle worker, as right. one who was resurrected. Right. None of that was uh, talked about until much later. Is it, is it fair to say, if I may follow up, yeah. is, is it fair to say that the importance, the value uh, of uh, his figures like Jesus is not so much in whether they existed, but in whether what has been attributed to them is worthwhile. In other words, the value of the teachings that are attributed to Jesus may be the important thing. Even if he didn't exist, if his teachings still, if the teachings attributed to him have tremendous value, Right. then we should read them. Right, right. And we should understand them. Right. We should see if they hold anything for us personally mm -hmm. that would lead us to uh, being better human beings. Right. And that's, that's not a, a minor accomplishment. Yeah. And you still have to do a lot of sifting through the New Testament in order to grab what is valuable and what is not. Because there were some that, you know, we, if we take that um, that it was a pristine collection of books and 
writings about him, uh, we would be wrong because some were obviously added much later, like centuries later. Uh, one particular one, if I can single them out, is the uh, passage in 1 John 5, 7, which is the one that was supposed, that's supposed to declare uh, without reservation the Trinity, which says there are three witnesses in heaven that verify, you know, witness to Jesus, and that is the, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, that one verse was added uh, uh, much later. I think it was around um, 1200, 1300 of the Common Era. But it was written and inserted in there to settle the argument because people were still debating about the, uh, uh, the Trinity, the concept of the Trinity. Another was the one, a familiar one we, we all heard about when the, um, the harlot was taken, was caught in the very act of adultery and was dragged out and they were getting ready to stone her to death and Jesus said, you know, was riding in the dirt and, and uh, basically said, uh, he who is out sin, you can cast the first stone. That was that. That was a, a, a oral story that was being passed around, and that wasn't added into the New Testament until centuries later. The point being, that, uh, like Brother Ray says, that and given that so much that these people did all these writings, they attributed to as a words of God. God wrote the Bible. This is the yeah. business that you we can, we, Jesus. We, but the thing is, we can't even trust. And this is another, you know. Uh, enigma or quagmire that we have to deal with is that we can't even trust the names that are on the document yes. as being the author. This can become what's usually referred to as a morass. <laughs> In other words, if, if you don't find a way to extricate yourself from it, you will sink. Uh, and I've been kind of trying to pull us a little bit out if I could. Uh, the model that Jesus' life, character, teachings uh, take preceded anyone called Yeshua mm -hmm. and so on. They can be found in earlier times. Sometimes word for word. And, <laughs> and so it's not difficult yeah. to imagine uh, that some Hellenized mm -hmm. Jews studying at the Library in Alexandria would have run across Babylonian texts, uh, Persian texts, and so on, uh, and understood that a tradition could be built uh, on this model. Uh, and so, what perhaps what we're looking at really is a model more than a person. Oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. that makes and, and one of the characters that preceded Jesus, of course, as a resurrected the deity is Asil, we call Asar. And, and I don't know if we can go any further back than that. Yeah, that can we? Yeah. I can. So I far can. in my study, yeah, I haven't I been able to get back. So that's really the basis, yeah. if you want to find one. Now, the peculiar thing is that we can't prove that he existed either. We run across in the text references to him. Uh, going back even 10,000 years mm -hmm. before the unification of Kemet. But there is no actual archaeological proof <laughs> there's no proof that in fact that's how existed. But the story of his life is redeeming because it promises eternal life after mortal death. And Jesus' life is said to have existed unfolded for our benefit in the same way. I guess that's right. why I met Jose. <laughs> because when I was in the Christian church, that was the doctrine was to be you know. what you're going to hell. So therefore, you want to be good about it. You have to take it to what it said, what we telling you today to take. So when I came to Jose, it wasn't so much revolution here as it was pan Africanism, but at the same time, the teaching still when I came to Jose really could undermine all that stuff. Because it takes from the origin at least what we believe, and uh, these people.
people that were doing the writing of the Bible who said it's the words of God, therefore, why not the words that are written on the wall, words of God? That's what Quran would have said. Okay. I guess the question that this discussion is brought to me is, why they select Jesus? What they could have said anybody, mm -hmm. right? Why him? Yeah. You know, Good something. question. I don't know if you've seen anything that would say why him. Especially since the word Jesus is not Hebrew. It's not, it's not Hebrew. And the way they put, they came up with Jesus is not a linguistic, doesn't provide a linguistic trail because it's, the, the theory is that they combined uh, uh, Zeus and uh, a, a, so they're going to uh, build this whole thing yeah, around yeah. somebody, why that would be for somebody. Right. So it was like grabbing a pull. I think they, yeah. like you were saying that this group possibly of Hellenized Jews in collaboration later with Romans saw an opportunity to build a model and saw the opportunity of the power that would accrue to them as a result of this con the, con so the construction. Out there doing something yeah. that they like and said, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and was it not also an effort of the New Testament uh, uh, compilers to provide a similar model as what existed in the Old Testament mm -hmm. and that you have a, a centralized figure <coughs> on some level, yeah. some parallel to, yeah. to a Moses, yeah. you know, leading yeah. uh, people to... Well, let, let me let me continue right, right after this, brother. Let me continue, and then maybe some um, some of the information that comes out in the next few, few screens will maybe be able to provide some more, shed some more light on, yeah. on your so question. Go ahead. So um, this is a throwback, a uh, couple classes ago, but I never really had a good idea of how big the uh, town of Jerusalem and Judea was. That was one of the things that um, made an impression on me was when uh, I visited Israel and from reading the Bible and listening to the stories growing up you it put an impression on your mind like things were grandiose and huge and I was just startled at how small uh, some things are the temple area the uh, <laughs> the the um, Just you know, the villages. Um, we I visited Nazareth, where supposedly he was. Uh, he grew up, and you know, there's you take it for granted that this is where he grew up, and all these buildings, and everything. And then I find out later that at his, at the time he, he supposedly lived, there weren't even any buildings there, and it may have not <coughs> been a Nazareth there. You know, it may have just been a little encampment or something. Um, then there's the picture that they paint of hell, and um, they use the word Gehenna to uh, as a term for hell or your place of, uh, of judgment after you know of evildoers after death. But it was Gehenna was uh, like the waste area. Well, actually, Gehenna they showed us what it was. It was just a little trough about this wide where the waste stuff you know would. <laughs> would flow outside the temple area. And it was very understated. <laughs> uh, so you would say Jerusalem at its height, yeah. even at, at, even after was not, was, not, was, was never the size of Oakland? Right. right. <laughs> no, okay. no. So at its height, it was never even the size of Oakland. Yeah. So the 77th brother claiming yeah. the crypt territory, whatever, yeah. they would have they overrun Jerusalem like no problem. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just to <laughs> have a yeah, people can... can put together a, a, a narrative uh, that carries a message that others believe for whatever reasons uh, and, uh, and associate their, and that responds to a need that the believers have. And over time, that need alone uh, can propel a narrative uh, so that it becomes owned publicly um, to varying degrees by people. We have an example of that today. It's called Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. Kwan There's no indigenous African tradition called Kwanzaa. It's African-American 
It, would, it was created to respond to African American needs at a particular historical point in time. And then it has spread. And uh, a lot of the people who believe in Kwanzaa don't ask the question, what are its sources? What is the ritual composed of? What is the origin of the artifacts, the, the, the instruments uh, that are used, and so on? They didn't just fall out of the air. Uh, they, were, they were constructed from known things. Right? So we shouldn't become too self-righteous when we discover that a tradition believed in by millions may have, let's, to be kind, call it a fictive basis. I'm not going to say this. Uh, I, don't, you know, I, I, don't want, I don't mean to demean any tradition by saying what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, that we may decide today to create a narrative around Asar. Wow, and that is persuasive based on what we know, having studied here in the Life Seminary, and, and put today's garments on him, updated him <laughs> in such a way that could capture the imagination if we do it well, particularly if we have higher-ups who give it support. For example, like Constantine, mm -hmm. you know, who inherited uh, the Roman Empire, wants to build it up, uh, and decides to close down all the the, the churches, the I'm sorry, the temples of Kemet, mm -hmm. and then passes laws. Uh, anyone caught observing these traditions will be killed, and their property is confiscated. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you you have that kind of power. Uh, then you can propel almost anything because people yeah, want to the, save their lives, the right? right? So <clears throat> I think that kind of what we have here, Christianity was eventually imposed on mm -hmm. um, people by the folks in power yeah. for reasons that probably have more to do with empire than with belief in any kind of sacred doctrine. Yeah. But, but the common people need doctrine need a character, a figure that they can identify with, need rituals, right, right. to reinforce the teachings and the tradition and so on, and then it moves from one country to another, it ends up in Rome, uh, there's a Ro the Roman, uh, uh, the head of the Roman church becomes the emperor, and before you know it, we're off and running. <laughs> and, and it reaches yeah. the plantations here and gets transformed to fit the needs of the plantation owners, and lo and behold, there we are. So <laughs> our ancestors are anyway. So you know, you have all this because there is isn't an historical figure. Doesn't mean that the the narrative doesn't have power. It may still have great power, even when it is imposed. It has a narrative. It's really what I think we struggle with is the passion that. That, is in, that, that flows from or that is imposed within the bounds of Christianity, the great passions, you know, and then the foundation is so so nebulous and so cloudy, mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that's to the, command that level of, of, that, of passion, yeah. it has to be dealing outside of reality, romanticism. That's the, and that's the term that, that, we, can, that we can yeah. use with certainty about all of it, is that it's cloudy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you all off your yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me go on. Subject like this. The last couple of quotes. Um, there's uh, this is uh, from Russell Shorto, who wrote Gospel Truth. He said, "There's no virgin birth in Mark's gospel for the simple reason that, according to scholarly consensus, it hadn't been invented yet." Yeah. Various Christian writers mention Paul's writing in the first century, but our gospels are not mentioned until well into the second century. So the Gospels, which are supposed to provide the basis for Paul's writings, and, and uh, Matthew, for one, says that all part of Paul's writings have been tampered with and uh, rewritten in order to support, but that Paul, because of his education and his announcement and who he was, and that he, had, he was an initiate into the, in the Gnostic, 
Gnostic uh, sects that uh, he was um, a Gnostic proponent instead of an uh, uh, antagonist. And that, that was one of the major studies we had to use and had to go through in seminary was examining the book of Colossians as being anti-Gnosticism or pro-Gnosticism. You know, and things are starting to clear up. It was really, it was still foggy after digging into it and researching it back then. I still couldn't come up with, uh, you know, yeah. one way or another. But you know, anyway, just the fist of Sophia. Uh, some, some of it, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was on my own, but not, uh, yeah. Okay, let me go on. <coughs> Here's some other quotes. Um, this is one for, from one of the church fathers. No. These are supposed to be the ones that uh, Christian theologians whose shoulders they stand on. He said, it is obvious that the difference between the copies is considerable, partly from the carelessness of individual scribes, partly from the impious audacity of some in correcting what is written, and partly also from those who added or re removed what seems good to them in the work of correction. And that was written by Origen. And... Uh, I was another of the North African brothers who uh, were one of the church leaders. And he, um, he died as well as Tertullian and a few others. They died uh, being considered as heretics. They were drummed out uh, later on. Um, in 367 of the common area, Athanasius of Alexandria in his ninth letter he, listed, he came up with a list of 27 books which now make up the present canon of New Testament scripture, insisting that these and these alone were texts that the church approved of as scripture. Any other book should not be read. All other Christian writing, writings were forgotten until the Nag Hammadi discovery in 1945. So this is quite a time, time gap, 367. Okay. Of the books used in Christian churches and mentioned by name in the writings of the, church, the Christian fathers during the first four centuries, at least 75 have entirely disappeared. What about the recent discovery of the Book of Thomas? Uh, the, that, that was, uh, yeah. We, well, we won't have time to cover it unless I can get to it next week. Okay. Uh, let me go on. What was the thing that Gustin fit in today? Um, he was, like I said, he was one that came up with some of the foundational concepts which we now are taking for granted in Christianity, like right. uh, original sin and. Um, like the Trinity. Uh, I don't know if he was the one that came up with the tr Trinity. Um, that was at the Nicene. Yeah, the, Ni the Nicene Council. So um, you know, that's when they formulated that. So um, anyway, <clears throat> let's go on. Here's some commentary on the Gnostics uh, by Gerald Massey and his lectures. He said, the only primitive Christians then, apart from or preceding the Christianized pagan church of Rome, were the various sects of Gnostics, not one of which was founded on a historical Christ. One and all they based upon the mystical Christ of the Gnosis and the mythical Messiah, the mythical Messiah, him who should come because he was the ever coming one, also known as Eum Hetep, the son of Ptah, in the Trinity of uh, Menefer, as a type of the eternal manifesting figuratively in time. That's in, yeah. in Menefer, that's the name of the morning sun. Eum Hetep. No. Oh. The, the one who oh, the ever coming. Oh, the ever coming one. <coughs> yes. 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 The, yes. the ever coming, the, uh, the one who comes into being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kepuri. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. To me, anyway. <coughs> uh, also, it says Christianity began as Gnosticism continued by means of conversion and perversion that were opposed in vain by Paul. The mysteries of the Gnostics were continued with a difference as Christian. The newly Christian rebeginnings re were not only shrouded in mystery, they were the same mysteries at root 
as those that were pre-extant. There were many sects of so-called Christians and various versions of the Christ, whether Cronian, and that is from Cronus, and it's interesting uh, when you look at the mythology of, of Cronus, who was the Greek, he was the Greek of the pre-Hellenistic Greeks, and he was the son of Uranus, who was the, the heavens, otherwise the heavens, or the sky, and Gaia, the, the earth. And this is, this is going to sound familiar. And uh, by his sister, uh, and he, he married his sister Rhea, and they uh, get the offspring from them were um, uh, Hades, Poseidon, Hera, and some other ones. But he immediately swallowed them. And because he did that, they had another offspring who was Zeus, who was the youngest. And his mother hid him and to keep him from being gobbled up. At which time later, when Zeus became uh, mature, he, f he defeated his father and forced him to regurgitate his sisters and brothers, which formed the pantheon of uh, Greek mythology. That's the way they do it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just make yeah. a short point? Uh, <clears throat> commented on the ever coming one as the one who produced the Keperu, or the, the physical uh, universe, so mm -hmm. to speak. Massey has put you in the head Oh, that, that's my, my. Is that yeah. you? But he, he does link. Uh, the ever coming one with you and Mahatev in the later page. That's why I, I inserted it. It's important to, to know, however, that the expression Ivan Hetep is the name of uh, Imhotep, mm -hmm. and which translates I come in peace. Right. The one, yeah. Uh, I. Actually, mm -hmm. not the one, mm -hmm. but the I. Mm -hmm. E. E. <laughs> or E. E. Mm -hmm. I come in peace. Uh, so I'm not sure about the... If it's a direct correlation? Yeah, I'm not, okay. I'm not sure that the yeah. ever-coming one and you and Hattep are referring to okay. the same thing. All right. Okay. Anyway, but I thought that um, a lot of the history of Cronus uh, reflected on um, Asar, the story of Asar. Anyway, so uh, whether Cronian, mythical or mystical, but the Church of Rome was the Christian church with foundations in Egypt. Hence the deities of Egypt which have been discovered at the foundations of Rome. So not only was Greece, but uh, it pr provided, uh, but the Romans also borrowed their deities from uh, Kibbe. Okay. I, I put here Christianity spread by the sword. This is what we were talking about uh, about the imposition of the religion of uh, in history, and these are some of the, just a few of the examples. There were many more, and I should have just put religion spread by the sword because we can see a parallel in Islam in uh, spreading its religion. But um, the Crusades uh, were focused on uh, controlling and uh, the Holy Land and protecting pilgrims to the Holy Land. Um, also, there were. Um, Crusades against heretics in Livonia, Courland, Estonia, Prussia, Lithuania. The Catharian and Albigensian heretics were, uh, tr uh, were tried, um, were forced or imposed upon. And in the Al Albigensian Crusade, half of France was exterminated. By the end of the 13th century, one million of the French heretics had been massacred. In 1487, Pope Innocent uh, VIII called for a crusade against the French Waldensians, who were already been declared heretics in the 1184 Council of Verona. They were hounded and killed until the 17th century. You're saying that, Christ, that the version of Christianity we inherited yeah. was imposed by the sword. Yes. And and we've been taught to believe it was a, it was not imposed. That it would spread yeah. because people believed in right. it and, and accepted, yeah, yeah and accepted it as openly and embraced. And there there are incidences where they forced it forced it on them, but 
where late, later the um, they were kicked out and the people reverted back to their uh, traditional beliefs only to have, you know, when Rome became even stronger to come back again. And, well, we're uh, primarily talking about the Catholic can, Church. Yes. Are we not? <laughs> yes, right. yes, we are. All right. Um, but, 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 but mistake enough, that, that's not a... That's not a small thing to say, mm -hmm. because everything else flowed from the Catholic Church. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Exactly. And you hear you, brother. The Catholic Church was Christianity at the time mm -hmm. of the ascendancy of yeah. Constantine and the emperors who followed him, because he converted mm -hmm. for his own reasons and then imposed Christianity throughout the empire and outlawed everything else. So to say that the Catholic Church, which actually descends from that time, uh, in Rome, uh, if we're talking only about Rome, is to say a lot, because Rome inherited all of that and preceded it, and was the primary instrument of the spread of Christianity throughout Europe. Constantine politicized it to be a thing of everybody will follow the state law and the state church. Politicized. He imposed it. Yeah. Period. Politicized. There's no other way to say it. Yeah. He and outlawed everything else. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's important because <clears throat> in, 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 with our current views today, uh, you know, Christianity is shared against a amongst a lot of different denominations. But in its, in its infancy and in its origin, we're primarily talking about the Catholic yeah. Church. Yes, exactly. Well, right now, you're talking about evangelical in the election right now. Yep. People being dogged to death. Not who it, they believe in. It, either Catholicism or the reactions to it. Mm -hmm. Now, there was, the, uh, there was another one I thought about but I don't have up here, but, um, and, it, and it helps shed light on um, things that are going on currently in Eastern Europe, but one of the greatest massacres was in a town in um, Herzegovina, yes. where the, an entire uh, town or village was wiped out. Yeah. Uh, no, this, uh, yeah, well, this is uh, the Catholic Church wiped out the whole village. But there were three ma major uh, inquisition. Uh, the first against the heretics and witches mainly. Second one, 95% of the victims were Jews. And the third one, Protestant heretics and witches were victims. Brother Keita, is, does this have anything to do with the fact that when you go into many churches today, you will see characters with wings but holding swords? Yeah. But what? <laughs> What is, uh, the, what is the purpose of the sword that they're holding? Because it looks... They tell... Well, the, this is what it said. That, bloody. That uh, the, 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 the word of God is the sword of truth, and the sword of truth will vanquish all, you know, lies. But, but this was his sword of truth. <laughs> 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 I mean, yeah. That's how it was said. Yeah. But it was... But it, historically and in reality, there was a literal sword to back to back up the, the sword of truth. The truth that was being imposed. It gave it gave substance to the truth that was being imposed. <laughs> you know, when you think about that sword, there's like this, I was I don't know what I was listening to or how I ended up hearing this, but it was like a sword of clouds by day and a sword of yeah. fire by yeah, night. Yeah. I was like, first of all, how do you get a sword of clouds? Yeah. But B, you know, yeah. it seems like yeah, this implication that these angels from the most high mm -hmm. were also you know, it, it, this idea that angels have to be sort of eunuchs, they have to be totally neutral, non yeah, yeah, yeah. type of, yeah. in, you know, entities yeah. wasn't something that really existed. It was like angels were also enforcers. They, they could also be enforcers or could also act in a way that was going to, where they would uphold God's ruling by any means necessary. Or in the case of Lucifer rebelling against God. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, within that, that's why it already impressed me in, as growing up uh, as a Catholic about the power of the archangel uh, Michael and Gabriel, because mm -hmm. they were definitely forces in hitting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were hitting. Yeah. 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 
But the other thing I was wondering why Knight Templars wouldn't have been included in that group. Too, oh yes, they they, they committed. Boys. Yeah, they uh -huh. the Knights Templars and the Hospitallers. Yes. They, they uh they were private groups who I think uh, covertly were, were, for, were formed group. yeah by the uh, Catholic hierarchy, and initially they became they were like protectors guarding you know, pilgrims traveling to and from uh, Jerusalem. But they became so powerful and became an entity unto themselves that um, not only, um, well, they were looting and um, uh, some of the riches down in, in uh, Israel and the Middle East, but in times when it, it profited them uh, financially, they went into business with the Saracens of the, uh, right. the, the, uh, the Muslims. And then at other times they turned against them. Right. And they became so rich and so powerful that they formed banks and were lending money. And so they became such a, a problem that um, that eventually rumors got out that they were performing uh, satanic uh, rituals and that part of their satanic rit rituals involved homosexuality right. and stuff, initiations. And so... They were crushed. They were crushed, yeah. yeah. In, in a word, yeah. Yeah. The Pope went into France and just kind yeah. of massacred yeah. you know. the vigilantes on But they, you know, they, and, um, but part of, but like with other secret societies, some of them, um, in order to escape persecution, sequestered themselves inside larger secret orders like the uh, Masons. Yeah. And if, if yeah. there is a level of the Masons, that is the. Uh, nice tip. Knights Templar now, yeah, that is a degree. So. Is it then any, uh, <laughs> should it not come as a, a surprise then that most ministers uh, proceed as if Christianity does not have a history? Yeah. Because in fact they don't want, having really? studied it, they don't yeah. want their parishioners yeah. to know. To know too much. They, yeah, they don't feel that you should know anything because, you know, it would inter interfere with your um, You would ask questions. Yeah, I'm trying to be uh, <laughs> your, Don't worry, um, brother. We are with it, their power. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're embracing of, you know, spiritual truth. Mm -hmm. I have a point I'd like to interject. Yeah. I mentioned Nicaea. Mm -hmm. of Nazareth, brother. I mentioned Nazareth to my brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. <coughs> he didn't know He didn't know that I knew about Nazareth in mm -hmm. Ethiopia, mm -hmm. which is a very wealthy city in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. It's a coffee growing, uh, what do you call it, when you go into uh, point, being. point being that Nazareth never was in, in the Middle East. Yeah. So uh, that's where Jesus, his father and mother came from, yeah. as well as Moses. That area is called Cush. Mm -hmm. Maybe that, is that what's behind there being a Thebes in Greece, is, you know, to try to give well, the it, illusion of a connection well, between... there's a whole city called Athens. Uh, yeah. And there's yeah. a goddess called Athena. Yeah. And when you look at the origin of that word, you see etymologically it, it's Athen. Yeah. Which is the sun. Yeah. yeah. Christianity is the much spirituality warmed over and distorted mm -hmm. and mixed with all sorts of other things. When you scratch it, <laughs> you see the parallels. Yeah. Around 777, Charlemagne, a devout Christian, after conquering the Saxon rebels, gave them a choice between bapti baptism and execution. <laughs> when they refused to convert, he had 4,500 of them beheaded in one morning uh, at Verdun on the Aller River. So that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of blood on, uh, spilled in one morning. Those little cities and towns, it must have been just... It's just soaked in blood. Yeah, because yeah. they were But they're so, quite, you know, if you go in a, on a, if you were on a tourist visit, you know, uh, <laughs> the, uh, it would be quaint and uh, you would have no idea what, what history lies behind it. Uh, it's estimated that Christian, uh, Europe was Christianized at a cost of about 8 to 10 million lives. The spread of Islam cost as many, if not more so. And the estimates that I've been reading are so, so you know, mind-boggling that, you know, uh, I have to get some more documentation just to support it. But, you know, there were numbers, just in India alone, in converting the uh, 
the Hindus in the area that are now Pakistan, they said between uh, 50 and uh, 80 uh, million. Uh, I, I, those numbers are hard to conceive that there were that many uh, people <laughs> there. But. What you're disclosing has implications for us today mm -hmm. here at Rosé. Mm -hmm. Because if we have, it raises the question as to whether Christianity and Islam are actually hostile to remain spirituality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is it? What does it then mean? I'm not trying to chase anyone away. Okay. What are the implications then of having members who still believe in Islam and or Christianity here? And that question has to be handled, I think, humanely. But I just raise it. Uh, do we, you know, <coughs> I mean, do we have moles in the house? <laughs> no, no, that assumes that they know this history. And in fact, most Christians don't. Right. So they're, they're proceeding based on uh, what has been hold to them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's important for them, therefore, to be in these classes. Mm -hmm. So how does this compare to Orthodox Christianity, like the Greeks who didn't do what the Romans did, and the Egyptians who didn't do what the Romans did, or even the Ethiopians? Their well, versions of Christianity are a little bit different than the European. Well, it's, it's a history, a part of that history that needs to be explored further. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because we could uh, trace the cross back to the Coptic cross and then back to the Ankh. And exactly. Th these are all so other parallels. and Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, and so looking at that uh, is important. But when I, when I mentioned the word Christianity, I was really speaking about what? Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's come to us from Rome. Well, I mentioned in one of the classes that there was an Eastern Church and a Western mm -hmm. Church. And the tradition of the East was more mystical mm -hmm. yes. than of the West. Yeah, and right. continues to be so today. Mm -hmm. But it seems like it's assumed that anybody who has a respect for or appreciation of Christianity is looking at just this. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in our times... In, right, that's the assumption. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the assumption. Right. And the assumption is not far off. Except that one has to say that the history isn't being taught anyway. Yeah. So how would they know? Well, I was thinking There's no the basis for an informed I was, judgment. I was thinking in the context of Jose when we had those oh. conversations about, well, some people come from Christian tradition, some people don't have any Christian tradition at all. You know, where are you in the midst of that? Sort yeah, I of think only they can answer those questions. Right, right. Just it's a good conversation to have yeah. uh, within the family. <laughs> and the assumption Close the doors. that again is Euro Christian. Right, yeah. Yeah. right. Christian when in, and when in actuality, that's not the case for everybody. Right. I may interject real quick. The Coptic Christian Church of Orthodox is Ethiopian. And they, do, they will tell you that it's not Western Christianity. And they are in tune with the Greeks. But the Greeks would not let the Ethiopian priests mm -hmm. come through the door first. They prejudice against the priests. Also, they speak in keys, so they don't tell yeah, their yeah. people, just like in the Catholic Church when they do it in Latin. Mm -hmm. uh, and not everybody understands the liturgy. But we can't proceed stereotypically. Yeah. But I, okay. let me just share this experience at a Catholic Church in Oakland, where I went with an ankh around my neck, mm -hmm. and was told by the priest to take it off. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. oh. Because it was evil. Oh, mm -hmm. no. And this is a Coptic priest. So there's a lot to, for us to explore, <laughs> and, and we can't all we can't do it in one class. At my, at my coffee shop, there's a copy of Ethiopian priest, and he asked me about why I wear the arm. He asked me to kiss the ring, which is the Ethiopian <laughs> ring, design, which I did. But the thing is that they on their web page they would tell you the word copy means Pharaoh of religion, and they call it the Purah. I understand. That is a site on the web, and the one that's always to look at things on the web through a different eyes. Because you'll go to another site and say something else. And so these are things that we, as I say, and I'm saying again, 
uh, that we need to look at more carefully. Did he say why was it evil? <laughs> I didn't ask him. I thought he just, I thought he just shared it to me. Uh, no, I, I oh. didn't want to talk to him after that. Oh. <laughs> we didn't have much in common. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I mean, exactly. attitudinally. Yeah. Okay. I didn't take it off. Yeah. Okay. And there was a reception afterwards, and I continued to wear it. Oh, okay. But, you know. Okay. Yeah. And listen, his attitude to... doesn't have to, have to be shared by me in terms of my reaction to the service that I attended, which I love. There's lots of silence, a lot of incense, uh, and uh, people there wearing their, their uh, shawls, and, and they were very quiet, very friendly, and so on. I'm just responding to this priest. So the service was conducted in English? No, it was actually conducted in... Uh, in, in it was maybe Gies. I didn't understand it. Yeah. Okay. What was being said. But I meditated through, throughout the whole thing. Yeah. And <laughs> was pleased to have gone, except for that one encounter. Okay, I wanted to close this uh, screen out with this quote from Voltaire, who famous, you know, um, atheist. But he said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Let me copy that down. Oh, shit. I think Hitler would agree to that. Hitler would agree with yeah. that, yeah. since he practiced it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody got that? Not almost. <laughs> this is why it's dangerous to, to, okay. to propel the view as the only worthwhile view, yeah. that power consists of the ability to convince people to accept your view. Mm -hmm. Hitler practiced that, too. But we have to remain open the possibility that we may be wrong yeah. for the things that we don't know and therefore we have to remain open to the idea that tomorrow we may change our minds mm -hmm. and, and, that, and, and feel that that is a good thing mm -hmm. right otherwise you get stuck yeah. where you are and that could be very problematic you have to edit as you go mm -hmm. yes you do yeah. uh, can I, could you pass around a sheet because I forgot to bring in the Okay, uh, let's go on. You know, Voltaire said a number of hairy things. Yeah. It's like, what is it? it is difficult to free fools from the chains they revere. <laughs> <laughs> Voltaire was heavy. <laughs> I, I loved him in yeah. philosophy class. Yeah. I, love yeah. I love philosophy. Yeah. Okay, uh, cursing your mother. This is a, a tendency in the development of uh, religion that we've seen. This is a quote from Charles Finch. He said, frequently in history, the followers of the older religion, though giving birth to the new one, are branded with a demonic and unholy aspect by the new devotees. Such was the fate of the followers of the Sethian religion vis-a-vis -vis the worshipers of Asar and Amon. Amon. Similarly, the followers of the Hebrew religion founded at Sinai cursed and abjured Pharaonic Egypt out of which their religion emerged. Egypt or Kemet came to epitomize evil and godlessness. Thus, Christian hostility towards its parental Judaic religion had ample historical precedent. Now, this is this is um, uh, one of the developments, and this was developed early, going back to the the, uh, the foundations of the Christian Church is the idea of replacement theology. And it has ramifications that affect us today. And, and uh, replacement theology is it's also known as supersessionism. And it assist, essentially teaches that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. In other words, the church are the chosen people now, not, not Israel. They've been replaced. The adherents of replacement theology believe the Jews are no longer God's chosen people. And God does not have specific future plans for the nation of Israel. All the different views of the relationship between the church and Israel can be divided into two camps. Either the church is a constitution, continuation of Israel, which is replacement of covenant theology, or the church is completely different and distinct from Israel, which is dispensationalism or premillennialism. Re replacement theology teaches that the church is a replacement for Israel and that many promises made to Israel in the Bible are fulfilled in the Christian church, not in Israel. So the prophecies in scripture concerning the blessing 
and restoration of Israel to the promised land are spiritualized or allegorized into promises of God's blessings for the church. Mm -hmm. And what has happened historically with that attitude or with that feeling, it provided a convenient basis and uh, subtext for world conquest. Mm -hmm. And that God <laughs> uh, had co-signed co it. <laughs> So what's changed, though, except for that? <laughs> except for that, the church is now favored by God over all other mm -hmm. possible religions. It's still monotheistic, or mm -hmm. claims to be monotheistic, mm -hmm. and it's still hegemonic. Mm -hmm. It believes that it should replace everything else. Right. Uh, no. So a kind of manifest destiny sort of thing. Right. That, that's and, what and I was going to mention. Jews yeah believe that we were given permission to, to carry yeah, out exactly. in ancient days. When, when, they, when they wiped out, uh, when they were given the uh, dictates to de utterly destroy, I'm trying to re remember that scripture where... Deuteronomy? It's in, I think it's Deuteronomy where, where they said, I'm trying to remember the tribe though, that uh, it escaped me now, but God told them to utterly wipe them out. Kill man, woman, child, infant. The dogs, the cattle, everything associated with it, wipe it all out. Annihilation. Yes. Yeah, I've been into that. I do yeah. too. I do too, but yes. I can't recall exactly um, what. Yes. Uh, For what reason? Land or? Well, yeah, that, that was because they lived on the land and uh, that God had promised them and that they were these were evil people. They were uh, uh, abhorrent people who practiced, uh, you know, some evil... Un, uh, Unclean kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of the but if you look, but once you look at it, you find out that there was no <laughs> difference in the Jews that took over. Exactly. Yeah. That's one of the more yeah. one of the more pointed parts of the editorializing that comes through mm -hmm. in Scripture so much. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they had to make a case for mm -hmm. occupying this land. Yeah. You know, they constructed a very good story, but integrating the people and all the bloodlust mm -hmm. unleashed to, to rid people of the land. It's just totally inconsistent with the devil and God, but you know, it's a good story. <coughs> well, one thing the, that Ama I, the Amalekites, that's the, the Amalekites. Oh yeah, the they Amalekites, were, they were yeah, bad people, yeah, you know, yeah, Amorites. Yeah, they were yeah the Amorites, people. yeah. All, all, the, all the tribes of Canaan. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was thinking about, at first I was going to say I'm having a hard time understanding, but I have to retract that. Mm -hmm. Under, uh, what, I'm think, what I'm thinking more so is, um, it's interesting to consider the very schizophrenic application of this replacement theology. Mm -hmm. Because on the one hand it says the church is being, you know, is replacing Israel and now it's really the church that has this and the other. But there is this rhetoric right now politically that refers is constantly referring to the Israelis as, as the chosen, chosen people. people. They're, they're, it's a struggle now. It's a, it's yeah, it's an ideological struggle. But this yeah. replacement theology was yeah. sort of key and is still being mm -hmm. um, used mm -hmm. and still being applied yeah. while at the same time the, the very thing that it is dispelling. Yeah. The and, 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 and Israel uh, in, in their believing they're the chosen, chosen people, believe that God has excused them for some of the atrocities mm -hmm. that they committed because they're so. They're the, so the, the defense yeah. that they put up is that we're so small and we're surrounded by enemies. We can do whatever mm -hmm. we want to in order to maintain our uh, our thing. Imagine a nation that believes that having a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, I mean, just yeah. imagine. That they have permission to do anything, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. use one of those yeah. in their own defense. Mm -hmm. Well, in your own defense, you can do things, but they are creating reasons to do what well, they want. They, 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 they want to continue to, to steal yeah. land yeah. from the indigenous right. people. So um, the, yeah, these the are some uh, anyway. the assignment for next week. Uh, we're going to touch on uh, astrology, some of the astrology astrological analysis, but we want to close next week with the current political implications of everything we've studied, how it affects us, how it affects Africans, you know, globally, all that. Think of, um, think of some ideas that you want to share 
at the close of discussion so next early week. In week. This is five, five so it's only five. six sessions. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We have one more to go. Yeah. And what's the next class? I believe it's the Hosea, isn't it? I, I think so. I think so. Uh, Brother Greg. I'm not lit. I'm not Yeah, I have it. Uh, no, it's in my other. It's coming around pretty fast. <laughs> anyway, let's go on. There's never enough time. Yep. Um, another thing. In, in our consciousness, another thing that shape see, in the, the church thinking today, a lot of uh, what we conceive of in the pictures that sh uh, shape our thinking did not really originate at the beginnings of Christianity, but were developed later. Yeah. And our, 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 um, our picture of hell and judgment come mainly from the writings of Dante Alighieri and John Milton and Inferno and in Paradise Lost and the images and pa medieval paintings of uh, like this that uh, came out. Um, that's where we get you know a lot of the fear and terror right. that we must submit to uh, Christianity in order to be saved. It's like they say Christianity is basically fire insurance. You know, <laughs> I, I, I just want to. <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> With that, I'm telling, I'm telling you what I've experienced in people, you know, <laughs> people, their, their reasons for coming to Christianity. That's why I'm here. What kind of a lie was it that created those photos? Yeah. Because there were no cameras. No, these were paintings. Right, but they could have been based on the, just me being the holistic. Yeah. They could have been based on... You know, these ideas that were passed down because oral tradition was Some of, it wasn't yeah. about written tradition, it was oral tradition. So you conjure these images in your mind based on what you're told. Yeah. You know, I'm guessing. And some of the, where, where the, where, where the writer's <laughs> fantasies were, were being uh, played out in the uh, artist's hands. But, um, no, but uh, like I said, uh, a lot of, you know, when I was in the church, a lot of the people that I talked to that were coming to church were coming out of fear, you know. And the fear that was imposed and created, you know. But you know what's very interesting about these ideas of hell? I'm sorry, I don't want to be the big mom today, but, but that's these right. ideas of hell. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why there should only be one. <laughs> these ideas, what's interesting about these ideas of hell is that now that we are, we you when you once you open up your consciousness and you think about the existence of hell on earth, hell is really this separation from the Most High. This when you get into the midst of a place when you're operating outside yourself and outside your understanding of spirit, etc., and then those descriptions become very true yeah. because that's what life is like for you yeah. when you don't know God. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Right. Then you're off the path. Right. Well, I'm going right. to skip path. Um, now, could I answer your question about oh, next class? Yeah. It'll be the Hosea. Uh, this class is in next, uh, this one, next Sunday. And then there are two weeks, uh, after which the Hosea begins on the 29th oh, April of 20th. April, yes, and goes through June 3rd. Six meetings and talk by Brother Hodge. I'm, I'm looking at Brother Keita's yeah. schedule here. And there will be a change in the summer because uh, Brother Jahi needs to flip his class with someone because he won't be in town during the time that we have him scheduled. So. Oh. So that's a decision you have to make in yeah. the future? Yeah. So. <coughs> right now we have Husea, Medu Nature, follows that, followed by the rituals, Kemet, and then the Book of Coming Forth by Day. Okay, let me, uh, I want to close with these. The, uh, having gone through all that, these are our, um, some ancient view of scripture uh, has, um, analyzed by Alvin Boyd Kuhn in uh, his book Lost Light. And looking at it, uh, the scriptures from the standpoint of ancient thinking in Kemet and among the Gnostics. And his statement is, uh, now man is distinctly a creature compounded of two natures, a higher and a lower, a spiritual and a sensual, a divine and a human, a mortal and immortal, and finally a fiery and a watery conjoined in a mutual relationship in the organic body of flesh. Speaking of man, Plato affirmed, through body it is an animal, through intellect it is a god. To create man, God incarnated the fiery spiritual principle of its life in the watery confines of material body. He further states, 
of vital significance at this point are two statements by St. Paul. That was not first which is spiritual. Again he says, For the natural man comprehendeth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he. Of course not, for he is not yet in that higher kingdom of evolution, and he must be transformed, transfigured, lifted up into a superior world of consciousness before he can cognize spiritual things. Evolution will thus transforming, and nothing else will. And um, again, he said, from the great uh, Egyptian ritual, which so cryptically allegorizes this earthly death, we learn that the mystery of the Sphinx originated with the conception of the earth as the place of passage, of burial and rebirth for the humanized deity. An ancient Egyptian name for the Sphinx was a car. And uh, you could verify this. Uh, That's okay. Proceed. You know, <laughs> later equated by Matthew with Matthew with Acor, the Valley of Sheol, and, uh, or the he Hebrew Hades. This was also the name of the tunnel through the underworld. And it is said that the very bones of the deities quake as the stars go through their triumphant courses through the tunnel of Acor. As the stars uh, were... Yeah, I care. Yeah. I care. Yeah. Uh, as the stars were the descending deities, the metaphor of stars passing through the underworld tunnels is entirely clear in its implications. The riddle of the Sphinx is but the riddle of mankind on this earth. The terms of the riddle at least become clearly defined if we know that the mystery pertains to this, our mortal life, above ground and not to our existence in some unlocalized underworld of theological fiction. And then uh, lastly... Can uh, I make a, a link yeah. here mm -hmm. with the class we had last Sunday? Mm -hmm. The tunnel... Uh, I care, I care two lions, one facing east, one facing west, the sun rising between the two. Uh, the tunnel is called Rusetau, and the, the theology says, or the practice says, that you move through this tunnel, and then you reach seven gates, to which you know about. And if you can rise through those gates, you will reach your, the region of light and become enlightened. Uh, and then beyond that you will reach the region where of origin, mm -hmm. where, where there are no things at all, mm. but bliss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and eternal, infinite space, and darkness and so on. So that's the trajectory that is mm. being referred to here. Mm -hmm. and, and you've been told about it in, in other contexts already. Um, Are you saying Shangri-La? Yeah, you said Shangri-La? Analogously, yes. Okay, uh, let me get this last part off. Say, uh, this is from Raoul Nefer. He says, uh, if man is made in the likeness of God, then why is this fact not evident in our daily experience? The answer is a simple one. Mankind as a whole has not completed its evolution or growth in the same way that a three-year-old has the faculties of an adult at a late, in a latent stage, so do the majority of people today have their divine faculties in a dormant sense. And it lies for us to stimulate our... Uh, to find our way. Find our way, To yeah. make a way. And awaken. Mm -hmm. Awaken yeah. Stir ourselves and ascend. So that we can shine. <laughs> okay. Oh, also, um, these, um, the su suggested reading list that I handed out the first time I taught the class, for some reason I lost it uh, on my computer. So I used uh, the list of Shango, let me borrow it. I'm retyping it, and I will send it to you by email. For those of you who would like one, make sure you put your email on the sign in sheet. And, um, Is there anything you want us to do between now and then? And the only other thing, like I said, uh, be, be prepared for, uh, we want to spend the first half of class next time just going over um, some of the astrological uh, connections. And then the last half, uh, we'll have a discussion about, like, like I said, the political, sociological, 
psychological implications of what all we have studied on the African mind and people. All right? Thank you. Uh, How long is the session going to be? That's right. We only have 90 minutes, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's always, always the opportunity to petition for more <laughs> if the teacher is willing. Yep. We could do an additional week since that space is not. Yeah, space is free. Well, that, that following week, I. Uh, my wife's birthday, so you're, I, you're begging off. Okay. Yeah, oh, I have, I have to. Okay. Okay. Family okay. first. Yeah, <laughs> have, have to right. keep her smiling. So I want you to get kicked out. So we have two free weeks. We can skip a week. And <laughs> <laughs> right, I think the second Sunday is the beginning of the next class. Yeah, so the two week period goes through first Sunday, second Sunday, two weeks, and then the class begins on that Sunday. So we would have we one week. Set, yeah, one week. yeah. So he could send it out. Yeah. You could do whatever you what pleases your heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you could hold your own convention. If you want. <laughs> Did you read Dante's Inferno? Uh, some of it. I have uh, uh, some excerpts at home, and uh, it's just uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, who was I'm t I couldn't remember the guy that uh, came up with the seven deadly sins. What was his name? It wasn't uh, Ignatius. It was. Uh, who is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That'll be a good question for next time. What, uh, 